Welcome to the University of Sydney's Distinguished Nursing Lecture Series. I am Phyllis Sharps, Professor Emerita, John Hopkins School of Nursing. I would like to start by acknowledging the tradition of custodianship and law of the country on which the University of Sydney campuses stand. We pay our respect to those who have cared and continue to care for the country. My talk will focus on building community and academic partnerships, team science as a pathway for en enhancing diversity and inclusion. And I am Phyllis Sharps, Professor Emerita, John Hopkins School of Nursing. The pre presentation objectives are to identify and define research or scholarships teams, discuss strategies for establishing and sustaining an academic and community research or scholarship partnership, and describe plans for disseminating scholarly research and projects that reflect the contribution of all team members. So let's start by talking about what is community. It means different things to different people. It means different things in different contexts. And it is important to define it in a way that is meaningful to you. Uh, choose and define a community in a way that you can make a long-term commitment because that will be important for overall success of any partnership. So if we um, first start with well-known dictionaries, you may find definitions that define community as a group of people who live in the same area, a group of people who have the same interests. So for example, religion, race, politics, profession. That is one way to start. Community is also described as a self-organized network of people with a common agenda or cause or interest who are collaborating by sharing ideas and information and other resources. Today, as we have seen, certainly with the recent pandemic, virtual communities have become very robust and have become important ways of sharing interests and common goals, and in our case, research and scholarship. So in terms of a faculty, you may find that you are a member of multiple communities. So you could consider a community of practice, a community of scholarship, a community um, that you may actually be both a member of both your practice interests and your scholarship. It's an opportunity um, and certainly in academic settings, if you can combine your teaching research and practice um, into something that is coherent uh, and makes sense to you, it will be very important to establishing your scholarship and um, that which you want to contribute to your community. So culturally competent research begins with an attitude of excellence, inclusion, diversity and cultural responsiveness. So if we look at culturally com competent research, there are no uniform definitions, but what you will find in common across all is understanding and appreciating and honoring uniqueness of each individual and community. So important definitions of culturally competent research include words such as or concepts such as inclusiveness, valuing the contribution of diverse individuals, uh, acknowledging and, and incorporating linguistic considerations. It's the recognition and embracing of differences in terms of values, attitudes, behaviors, and practices, such as the way we dress, the type of food we eat, the language um, and music and so forth. Cultural competence in research is even more elusive to define. Um, so it's important to, to know what the funding requirements are because often they mandate um, uh, guidelines for what groups of people should be include, included in your research. Um, often policies support the inclusion of vulnerable populations. And um, certainly in our country, in the US, vulnerable populations are often the ethnic racial minority groups, the poor, 
um, which is often women and children and the medically underserved. And so we have increased um, responsibility as researchers as we incorporate these groups um, into our research and into our practice that so we also protect um, them as vulnerable populations. One of the things that I quote I um, have included in many of my presentations and, and still resonates with me is that constituencies of the poor and powerless must prove their case for change. But the rich and powerful do not need hard data to maintain the status quo. And so it's often hard, di more difficult for the poor and the underserved people to articulate the changes that they need, need in their health care or other community um, conditions that they find themselves. But the rich and the powerful, as we know, and often it is uh, white men with money, um, really often are able to maintain the status quo um, without a lot of real hard data of, of what they want to do. They have the power. So in culturally competent research, we don't make any assumptions. There are no perfect studies. Um, research synthesis that needs to combine qualitative and quantitative, quantitative data um, is often um, needed. Um, and, and using both the numbers as well as the stories of people to really interpret um, and understand what you're finding in your research. Um, <clears throat> culturally competent research requires interdisciplinary uh, collaborations. And you know, if you are a reviewer or making responsible decisions about funding your research, culturally competent research um, should not be funded. Good science is culturally competent research. So when we're working with minority or populations that are vulnerable, um, understand that they continue to struggle with health issues, with policies, with housing. Um, there are many, law enforcement, there are many things that these often vulnerable populations struggle with. So um, when you wanna work with them as a researcher, um, be sure that you're asking in a, in a respectful way and that you are collaborating in a way that um, empowers them also. Recognize um, that when, uh, and if you are a member of a vulnerable population, that majority uh, researchers, um, nurse researchers um, have goodwill, but they, they make mistakes and um, be gracious in the way that you point out um, things that, that um, are sensitive and that they need to be aware of. Insist upon um, as a member of a vulnerable group that, that the research or the practice or the collaboration should eventually lead to independence and the uh, an enhanced capability on the group's part to be able to advocate for themselves. Most of us um, are either in terms of the culture of research, um, we're either part of that culture or um, in, in many places it's, it's a white privilege group. So um, you <clears throat> as a member of, of the majority group, the, the research scientists have a duty to challenge and educate your colleagues when they are um, continuing and stressing things that are not true, that are built on misinformation. Um, recognize the privilege that you have. And of course, we talk a lot about white privilege, but there are many of us have privileges, um, uh, privileges of better education, privileges related to secure incomes in our jobs, um, the ability to practice religion freely. So recognize the privilege that you have um, and be gracious in the way that you work with vulnerable populations. Um, also avoid tokenism. Um, respect for what every member of your team is contributing or the population that you're working with. Be genuine in your interest and your collaboration. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, learn another culture. If you're going to be working with a group from uh, a vulnerable population or a different culture, 
it's your job to also learn about the culture, the music they listen to, the food they eat, the news media they listen to. So important first steps for establishing culturally competent research is really be to become a part of the community. Um, invest in the community and its mem and its members. Um, don't be seen as uh, a helicopter member of, of a community, that you come in for a specific purpose, you do your research, you get your funding, or your practice initiative is funded, and then when the money goes, you go. Um, include the community in every phase of your research or if you're developing a practice initiative or, or a project. <clears throat> From the very beginning, it's important to acknowledge um, ethnic cultural differences and similarities. Um, if there are books written about the culture, I happen to do, do um, particularly early in my career, um, was very moved by the book Far From Home, which talked about the Hmong population in the United States and how difficult it was for them to be, <clears throat> excuse me, in integrated into the US culture. Um, know your community and, and you may need to incorporate cultural brokers as a part of your team to help you understand so that you design um, conceptually uh, a study that is going to be well received and, and builds on the community that you're working with. <clears throat> Excuse me. Use reliable data sources. Don't depend on um, what you've heard or what you've seen or even what the news says. Go to the source and work in the community. Um, so that's the background, the research synthesis, the concepts of your research are based on accuracy of the community. So do not perpetuate myths and assumptions. If you don't know, your cultural broker or key informants in the community can help. Usually culturally re relevant theories and concepts, um, things that um, impact ethnic pride, identity. Um, I, I always think it's very important to build on strength um, models for you rather than deficits. Um, Unfortunately, in healthcare, we often learn from deficit models. We look at problems, we look at weaknesses, but in working with community and community-based research, um, begin to think about protective factors and strength. Why have people been able to survive certain illnesses, certain um, adverse contexts in their community, um, rather than always looking at people as problems and, and weaknesses? Explore relevant theories. So a lot of the work I do is with uh, women. Um, and so the womenist theory um, described by a colleague, uh, Jeanette Taylor, who was very helpful in the beginning as I started work, some of the work I was doing. In the design and plan phase, you know, um, many funding agencies um, will, the, a randomized clinical trial is, is kind of the gold standard, but for often for community-based re research, um, those methodologies may not be the best. And so looking at action research models or consensus design models, nested design or community-based participatory research methods. Um, and often those methods are uh, may be seen as more challenging because they involve the community members and agencies from the very beginning and may be a slower um, design model to build, but um, most often are associated with strong um, research designs and um, moving your science ahead. Mixed methods are good. Um, and, and most of the studies that you've read that I've published, um, I do use both quantitative and qualitative methods. Uh, I understand that it's the numbers uh, and the effect size that make a difference in policy and advocacy, but the stories behind those numbers are also very important. Um, also understand that qualitative data is not necessarily less rigorous data and quantitative uh, data numbers are not necessarily less ethical or contextual or co culturally competent. Um, certainly as you select uh, questionnaires, surveys, um, it's important to 
be sure that you're selecting culturally competent measures, uh, that the words will translate in the same way that the words and, and, and the design reflect the community that you're working with. Important also as you design and plan are uh, methodological considerations around data collection methods. Um, so again, race and ethnic specific uh, evaluation methods are important. Um, have the research questionnaires and surveys been used with the population um, that you are working with? Um, back translation around um, measures if you're using uh, taking a measure and putting it in a different language um, testing the measures before you fully implement to be sure that uh, the words are are meaning the same words and sometimes um, what we've learned in, in some of the research we've done in the caribbean islands is that some words and some concepts don't exist and so you have to figure out other ways of capturing, capturing that kind of data. Selecting the team is also very important. Um, multidisciplinary teams, multi-ethnic teams, multicultural teams, gender diversity, uh, by all means mutual respect among all of the team members and no one on the team is a token. Um, you don't wanna have a data collector that looks like the community and that's all you see that person as. Um, they are a valuable member of your team and um, can certainly help you with some of the cultural issues, but also should be included in papers and presentations um, and that kind of thing. Culturally, so when you get to the empirical phase or the, or the time when you're actually implementing your study and uh, collecting data, uh, you may have to look beyond the traditional settings where we often collect data. So be in, so this is also where your community connections are going to be very important, that you feel comfortable and your team is comfortable going to churches or places of worship, uh, barber shops, beauty shops, nail salons, um, places where people are um, that are the people you want to include in your research. Um, always come with gifts, um, whether it, um, it, sometimes it's not money, sometimes it's food, uh, sometimes it's service. Um, one of the uh, communities that we have worked with um, with my studies is health departments. And so um, to be able to provide no cost service, in-service education and continuing education was um, very well accepted by supervisors and, and therefore they were uh, more readily likely to um, release or have their nurses involved in our work. Um, one of the studies we did um, was looking at uh, parenting for uh, uh, low-income African-American women, um, and we picked and we recruited women from hospital settings. And um, we learned from women that um, most of them had not received balloons or flowers at the time of discharge, and so that was the incentive that we used for that particular study. So again, knowing your community. Um, and knowing um, the kinds of gifts and contributions um, that would be meaningful, but also you are acknowledging that their time is valuable for, for your research um, and that you want to show appreciation. Um, so again, the more you can be non-hierarchical and culturally sensitive and responsive in your interview uh, techniques will be very important, particularly for uh, interview surveys, uh, qualitative studies, so that you are listening to studies, listening to stories of individuals. Um, sometimes um, it might be to your benefit to have an interviewer um, that would be more readily acceptable um, by the, the community members and, and willing to talk but also that member is a very valued member of your research team and should be included in the interpretation and eventually writing of uh, manuscripts or whatever comes from your study. Understand the history of discrimination and oppression for the groups that you may be working with. Um, there is ample opportunity for mistrust between the community members and the research team. Um, and so you have to earn, go with the notion that you have to earn the trust 
of um, the participants. And whatever you say or promise, um, you have to be able to deliver on that. Um, always go with an attitude of humility because there are things that you're going to learn from the community just as they will learn um, from you. The analytical phase um, is often very critical to really pull out the richness from your data um, so that you may have to do path analysis, multiple uh, linear regression models, um, many more sophisticated models. And so uh, in addition to having a community member as a, the beginning part of your research, um, someone, um, uh, you know, your biostatistician who is, uh, uh, has competence in working with vulnerable populations and communities and will know about the data that you're working with. Um, so also, Think about, we have a tendency to group uh, many uh, racial ethnic groups, at, uh, or particularly ethnic groups as one group of people. And, and we know that that um, is not um, necessarily true. And you may miss some of the um, findings in your data. So for instance, people tend to look as black at black people um, as um, we're all one group of people. And indeed we're not in, in our country. Um, we have people like myself that are African-Americans um, and my heritage comes from Africa, but I'm an American. My family is three or four generations, but we also have African immigrants, um, people who come from the com continent of Africa and, and first generation. Uh, we have uh, people for, with African heritage that come from South America and Cuba. So you have to be very careful um, as you work. And very few studies that have racial ethnic differences are really um, teasing out those differences. Um, important to look for income and, 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 and control for that. Um, I think as you continue to work with vulnerable groups, you will find that poverty probably looks the same across um, different racial and ethnic groups, but it is important to control for those that there are high income, um, you know, racial and ethnic groups as well as low income. And so there may be differences in the findings. Um, you also need to be taken to account if you are using um, people of different age ranges. Um, so that you know, if you're studying children and you say, I'm going to study children from six to 12, well, there are at least two or three developmental age ranges in that time frame, And so it will be important to understand that. And certainly um, make sure that you are including gender and ethnic differences unless um, it is a study of a particular gender or, or a particular ethnicity. Neighborhood um, context and dimensional analysis is also very important. Um, we know neighborhood characteristics structural analysis and some of the new ways that we can study um, differences by using GPS technology. Also, um, we have people now beginning to study more carefully the impact of green space on health. And so give those considerations as you uh, uh, define your community-based research. And again, as I've said previously, when you get to uh, interpreting the results and trying to understand them in um, both your scientific context, but the cultural context, your community members, on, uh, both whether they were a part of your research team or community informants, um, it would be very good to go back to them and to confirm your, your interpretation um, with what it means for in the community. So again, it was, as you get to the uh, dissemination phase, um, validation of the findings, it's also important to go back to the group um, before you do any presentations and publications because you are representing um, that community in your finding um, and disseminate results that will empower or build uh, capacity. Um, I think it's always important, and as we've learned in ethics courses, do no harm. Um, don't have your research or your findings or anything that, is, that comes out of your team being harmful to the community. 
Publications should include all team members as authors and presentations should reflect and include community partners where appropriate. So how do we survive? How do we thrive in academic settings, whether it's practice or research within a community? Um, so going back to, um, as I described earlier in the presentation, defining a community. Um, so define your community of practice or where you think you want to be doing your research. Um, and it should be something that you can be committed to over, um, a, I would say, a lifetime of research, but that you can be passionate about. Um, build a community um, in terms of your partnership, whether it's an academic community partnership where nurturing is the norm, that, that you are committed to the welfare, not only of your research team members, but the community partners all, also, that you're committed to the success of all members. So um, one of the projects that I worked with, we were using community health workers to um, help um, women get into our parenting classes. And, um, and there needed to be a lot of training um, for the community health workers um, to be able to, to carry out the research protocols. And we worked with a local, um, we call them community colleges, maybe technical colleges, to actually build the training so that it could be used in a way um, for the participants um, for, for uh, college cre credit. And so when um, the research was over after four or five years, many of our workers went on and were able to use um, that training to um, help them get into uh, other training programs um, that allowed them to get uh, beginning college degrees and, and move on into other fields. Um, trust is very important. Um, and you do that by spelling out the, the benefits and the expectations for all. And that's done early on in building your team. Clear expectations, sometimes give and take because um, you know, life happens. Um, and um, demands change, but that people are expected to commit to and, and deliver on um, their commitments. Uh, meeting deadline shows mutual respect for everyone. Community connections are important. So you wanna be a real member of the community. Um, so again, as I said, in one of the projects we worked on, uh, our Dove project, which I'll talk about a little bit as we go on, um, we worked a lot with health departments. And so um, because it focused on partner violence, um, I became the resident expert um, in the health department. So when they needed to do training, um, both for their team members and their health department nurses, but maybe for a community event, um, they knew that they could call on me to help design um, what it was um, that they were needing. Um, I've said before, meaningful roles for your community members. Um, emphasizing again, do no harm um, to the community that you're working with. Share what you learn with the community uh, in ways that will be useful for them. Um, share what you learn in your research setting so that you're not um, reinforcing myths that people uh, tend to, to um, continue. Um, and I think this becomes particularly important if you're teaching um, and preparing uh, providers, nurses, uh, and other healthcare, um, share the information that you learn rather than, than um, perpetrating myths or untruths about a community. Enhance the community and help, hopefully that things that you discover in your research can be used to empower the community to achieve the goals that, that they want. Acknowledge limitations. Control is always <clears throat> an interest. Um, there is an interdependence between you as a faculty member and the community studies uh, and practices. Uh, um, and so that um, you can only control what you can control as a faculty member and also appreciate that there are certain things that your community members, whether it's a health department or a nurse or, or whoever you're working with, there are certain things that they have power over. Always communication with a capital C is so important. Sharing information, giving people updates. Um, no one wants to hear, particularly in community, about some finding 
um, that you've found about a community before they have a chance to, to hear about it. Uh, also understand that there are differences in motivation. Um, you know, faculty, we're motivated often by getting papers, getting funding, and it's, you know, it's tied to our own promotion and how we do in, in the academy, but community members are more, you know, maybe interested in getting the information to promote a cause that's important to them. Um, in the case of uh, working with other health providers, um, sometimes sharing the knowledge um, that they're gaining is important for enhancing their practice. So recognize that motivations uh, may be different, but should be always honored. And I can't say enough, celebrate as you go along. Um, have fun along the way. Um, I always talk about working hard because um, research and practice is hard, but when the, the victories come, the celebrations, be, take time to celebrate, whether it's a publication or a presentation, when you've met a recruitment goal, um, study team members that may meet, meet milestones in their own professional development. So celebrate the milestones, but also be supported because you know there are going to be rejections and dis uh, disappointments as you go along. Uh, not getting a grant that everyone worked hard on. Uh, not getting published with the first article. Slow recruitment and so forth. Maya Angelo said, "Striving for said this about ex excellence and striving and surviving and thriving." Surviving is important, but thriving is elegant. And when, and when you are committed to excellence and you are able to continue to, to meet those standards of excellence, that is elegant. So strategies to consider and lessons that we learned from doing community-based research. Um, here, I'd like to talk about my own research projects, um, which um, um, lessons learned from a randomized clinical trial. Um, the DOVE intervention, um, DOVE was an acronym for Domestic Violence Enhanced Home Visitation. My colleague, uh, Dr. Bullock and myself were funded twice from our uh, national funding agency, the National Institutes of Nursing Research, and also the National Institutes of Child Health and Development. Um, and so this is our research team and, and you can see it's, um, I can't say there's a lot of gender diversity, but there are um, diversity across universities, uh, diversity in terms of uh, um, expertise that people bring. Um, several of the individuals, Dr. Uh, um, Alhusen uh, was a doctoral student when she started, and I just got a letter from her today that she's um, I'm hoping to be put in a portfolio for promotion to professor. Um, Dr. Camille Burnett was a fellow when she started research and we had a number of other student members on our team. So just by background, uh, when, when, when I talk about intimate partner violence, I'm talking about um, physical, sexual, and emotional violence that happens to a woman before pregnancy, during pregnancy, and around pregnancy. So we want to think about that child bearing gear um, is the time period I'm talking about. Um, I say she a lot, but certainly we know that um, uh, men are um, can uh, be abused. Um, and we know with modern technology that people are um, uh, there are variations in, in how people become parents, but basically I'm talking about the type of violence um, that goes on between intimate and former partners. And they may be same sex partners, um, or they may be um, what we typically think of, or we often think of as men and women partners. Um, by background, um, intimate partner violence is, is pretty common. Um, it varies certainly by setting and by country, but anywhere between 10 and 20% of women experience uh, violence during pregnancy. Uh, most studies, um, at least in our country, in the US um, report around four to 8%. Uh, and I like to put this in the context that many of us as healthcare providers um, spend a lot of time learning about the hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. 
Um, and they occur maybe in 7% of all pregnancies. Uh, I have a feeling that we spend more time with that because we know how to treat that. We know protocols, we know medications, um, but indeed more women will be hurt um, and, and have adverse outcomes related to intimate partner violence. And we know that the most significant risk factor for intimate partner violence during um, pregnancy is abuse that occurred before the pregnancy. So the Dove study was a multi-site randomized control trial. It had uh, mixed methods. We had quantitative and qualitative uh, ways of collecting data. Um, it took place in urban settings and rural settings. Um, and we had three randomization designs. Um, in the urban setting, um, which was in my city, Baltimore, and St. Louis in uh, another state in the US, um, we randomized a health department to, um, to receive the Dove intervention or usual care. In the state of Missouri, we had the whole state adopted our Dove intervention. So we randomized um, usual care to 12 health, 12 health departments with usual care. And, um, and 12 that were using the dub. We also used Dr. David Zoll's Nurse Family Partnership um, and we drew um, those that were um, prospectively uh, having home visits and then we drew cases out of the database. Um, the, this was a home visit intervention that was done primarily by uh, nurses, but we did have some lay or peer home visitors. The Dove intervention is a, a, a brochure-driven intervention, um, and um, it aims to decrease violence of pregnant women. Um, both the Dove intervention and the usual care group did receive uh, community referrals for intimate partner violence. All women um, were eligible to, for the study if they um, were assessed and positive for intimate partner violence. This is our, again, the randomization design that I talked about in words um, on, as you look at the screen on the left side is the urban one health department. In the middle uh, is the Missouri health department where we had 12 health departments across the state. And then um, to the far right is the uh, nurse family partnership and where we selected um, we had some prospective women that were being seen at the time of the study, and then we matched them with cases from the national database. We collected data at baseline and then at pregnancy delivery and all the way for 12 months out postpartum. So this is our sample. Um, and I think the important thing to um, really take away is that the Dove and the, the Dove sample and the usual care sample were not statistically different. Um, and so we can feel um, a bit confident um, that the results we were seeing were from the Dove intervention. Um, <clears throat> it was largely a sample of African-American women um, the majority had um, less than high school education, the majority were unmarried, and um, the majority were unemployed or employed part-time. So um, here we can see on the, the left part of the chart is the Dove, and the right part of the chart is the usual care. Um, you can see at baseline everyone using the conflict tactic scale, everyone um, had about the same level of violence entering the study. And even at 12 months, we, we were very disappointed uh, or um, were not the results we expected that everybody got better at 12 months. But, but what was the strength of this study is that uh, at women who were able to stay with the study and that we were able to collect data on at 12 months, we pretty significant, at 24 months, reported significantly lower scores compared to women in the usual care group. This is another way of looking at the uh, time by treatment interaction. And you can see the deep, deeper orange line, um, which has the greatest dip is the Dove group. Um, and you can see that everyone pretty much studied at, started out at the same level. 
But as time um, worn on, the intervention effect was much greater at 24 months. Uh, women, we did uh, three intervention studies prenatally and, and three postpartum. So about uh, five to six months postpartum, the intervention was over. So we were able to see an effect even at 24 uh, months. And again, this is another way of looking at the change over time and that the dub group, which is the silent line, um, changed dramatically um, as time went on. Some of that is, um, as we talk to women in the qualitative study, is changes in partners um, and women. Um, when you're looking at changing the complex behavior, um, such as IBV, um, I think it takes women time to be able to, to have the courage to, to make the changes. So what did we learn analytically from doing this study? Um, that um, we found that our results were similar to most trials that had been reported, um, that the violence decreases over time. It seems to be much more of an issue around pregnancy, um, but as interviews showed that as women, um, it's kind of a honeymoon period in the postpartum period, but then as women, the abuse uh, increases again after um, the babies are a little older and the women begin to draw on the community resources um, more so. Going far and out um, was really important for this study and seeing what happened over time and, and the impact of the intervention at 24 months. We use multiple um, uh, analytic techniques and we also use modeling to capture some of the um, data um, so that we could use uh, control for missing data. Um, so the choice of covariates was very important in looking at age and depression scores. Um, we use theoretically driven multiple imputation models for missing data. And so that it, um, is often a challenge for longitudinal studies, but we had a uh, um, fabulous biostatistician that really understood and could work with um, the nuances of the data. Um, we used a commonly um, used um, assessment tool, the conflict tactic scale two, um, because it's used across many studies. In fact, the severity of violence against women scale, we also use, and, um, and, and that probably um, was more, um, I think, culturally re responsive and appreciative of women. They seem to negotiate, they seem to understand, um, and the, 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 the questions used on the scale um, really represented um, their experiences more so. Um, but we looked at both um, severity and frequency. We also did not use a negotiation scale, which is, uh, is a nonviolence. Um, and it's kind of the thing that you'd want people to do is um, that, you know, we talked it through, I left when it got heated. So we didn't count that as violence, but we used the physical aggression, the physical assault and sexual coercion. Um, so, and we use, as I said, both severity and frequency. So in terms of lessons that we learned for retention is that the research team and the home visit teams um, bonded over the time we were in the study, that they developed trust for us and we developed trust for them. And often we knew where mothers were that had been lost from the intervention and in an ethical way, were able to share information um, and to keep women in services. Um, we kept women safe um, and we had a number of safety protocols, both for the home visitors, um, as well as we collected a lot of information on how to contact women, knowing that women's, um, particularly these vulnerable women, uh, abused women, um, situations change uh, and they go from being homeless to couch, show, uh, couch surfing um, to being in shelters and, and that kind of thing. We had just a plain business card with a toll-free number on it that didn't alert partners necessarily to what it was, but women just felt that that was a safe thing for them. Um, the one of our papers, the Town and Gown Partnership, 
um, talks about how we develop, which is referenced at the bottom of the slide, is talking about how we develop those. Um, so there were, of course, issues for the partnership. Um, both we in, in, implemented our study in urban and rural settings. Um, home visitors uh, lacked a lot of the education um, and how to import um, and uh, implement research protocols. So lots of training and, um, and training periodically throughout the, uh, the research study, kind of booster training. Um, often they started out with really not understanding and feeling uncomfortable about screening for IPV, but once they got it, once they realized also that in some ways they were further victimizing uh, women when they didn't ask questions and, and, and connecting women with resources, they became more um, comfortable. Some of the challenges in our rural settings is that health departments and women were spread out and so a lot of traveling on the part of the, the research team to, to go out in um, different communities and collect uh, data. Um, the urban settings, um, often the, uh, the caseload was very heavy for the nurses, the home visit nurses, and, um, and as much as they supported the research, the kind of things to, to implement the protocol were seen as um, um, burdensome. Um, urban settings, uh, again, often have large caseloads, and so, um, again, supporting the research team um, and the protocols um, were um, often challenging. So successful town and gown partnerships, um, town meaning the community and gown meaning us in the academic arena. Um, so successful partnerships must recognize that we have the opportunity to bring evidence-based uh, interventions to practice settings, but it may require additional training. Um, and so um, setting that forward in your team. Both town and gown partners have to actively participate in the recruiting to be successful. So in this case, um, we didn't have a separate uh, Dove intervention team. They were health department uh, personnel that we trained. And, um, and so um, it was important to support them in the work they do because it was important also to the research. Home visitors talked to us about um, successful strategies like building the relationship, the rapport and, and trust um, with the women that they were working with. And so again, based upon their relationship, um, they did not wanna introduce the dub at the first meeting, but asked if we could alter our protocol to the subsequent meetings. Um, and so we honored that. Um, and so they were able to bring up the IV, IV intimate partner violence more casually in the conversation um, with their the women and um, and learn to be also non-judgmental as they talk to women about um, what was going on on and 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 talking in terms of helping the women that they were intervening with on what is you know what does a, a quote normal or a, a relationship between partners and showing respect for their situation. Um, they also commented that the multiple training workshops was very crucial to changing their practice. The, um, they began to rethink about stirring the pot and decreasing their own fear. Um, the safety measures that we um, also gave during the training about what happens if the abuser walks in um, also helped them feel more confident and that the home visitors came to an increased realization that I may be hurting my client um, and outcomes by trying to achieve and the outcomes that I want to achieve if I'm not talking to her about abuse and getting her connected. So Dove was a clinically significant project. It combined evidence-based protocols. It could be fully integrated into existing culturally-based approaches as well as the protocols of the health department. The intervention cost was low. Um, the intervention does require buy-in from the highest level in, you know, in your agency, the, the supervisory. Women had many co positive comments about Dove and uh, anecdotally, because we were in the field so long, some women actually were pregnant um, again before the study was over and wanted to be uh, enrolled a, a subsequent time. And 
course, we weren't able to do that. But um, so the second trial, and I'm going to just go quickly here, was perinatal home visitation enhanced with M Health. Um, we called it Dove Two, and basically, what we learned from the um, that the screening, even with paper and pencil, and the one-on-one -on -one interviews, um, were still a challenge for many home visitors. Um, so we wondered if we introduced um, technology, would that make a difference? So we uh, had, again, a randomized control trial. Um, we were test testing um, what would be easier and, and could we identify more women using paper and pencil um, compared to computer tablet screening. So women who um, screened in for violence, um, they were randomized to either the paper um, group or the tablet group. And however you screened in, that was how you continued. So if you screened in for paper and pencil, you, you um, did our first Dove paper intervention. And if you screened in for computer tablet, you uh, were ran, you also had the intervention um, using the computer tablet. So we basically were not testing um, the intervention because we knew that that worked, but we were testing whether uh, screening could be improved by using technology. So these are just some of uh, screenshots of what the uh, intervention looked, the screening and intervention looked like on the computer tablets. We used a platform um, called eMocha. And so it was a touch screen with radio um, button. So this one was the beginning of telling, uh, talking to women why we basically took the brochure and put it into a computer form. Um, so why we were concerned about abuse and what it was. Um, and then again, this was the first tool, the abuse assessment screen. Um, and they would just, they could either do a touch screen um, or we also had audio. And um, what was good about the second study on um, Spanish as um, speaking immigrants are, were growing in both of the locales we were using. And so we were able to have a Spanish version of the, uh, implement, the screening and intervention. This is a women's experience with abuse. And you can see uh, women could either use a cursor or touch the screen. We also had audio so that um, if abuser or a family member came in, a woman could listen without people necessarily knowing what she was listening to. We also had a, a, um, a kind of a kill switch on the tablet so that if she was concerned, she could touch that button and it would immediately go into a video of child health and care. And so again, not to alert folks um, to what she was actually looking at. So in terms of what we found is that um, we had about 416 women in the trial um, and we found that it didn't make any difference whether we screened with paper or with tablet, um, the prevalence rate was pretty similar. So, uh, we, so that was an important finding for us. We did find that there were some different patterns that uh, urban um, folks uh, um, had, um, we found higher prevalence rates using paper, whereas suburban women, um, again, none of these results are really statistically significant, but urban, suburban women, we found higher rates um, using the tablet. Um, we also found that um, in the rural setting, we had much higher rates using um, paper um, compared to uh, tablets. Um, so again, we had a higher prevalence of among African American populations when we use the paper, as opposed to um, in European women, um, the tablets were the much higher rate. So women, so I think the important implications of all of these findings is that are that women will re review, reveal their abuse, regardless how, to how we ask them. So this is an important strategy that healthcare providers do need to screen and it doesn't matter which technique um, you're using. And it's important because we can connect women to resources to keep themselves safe and to have better pregnancy outcomes. So again, from the home provider, home visitors that use the tablets, 
um, they still felt that the relationship is trust and is pivotal and that, you know, to continue to be trust and openness. Um, the main, maintaining boundaries uh, were a challenge, um, but they also understood that asking is, was, was a way of showing caring and that the tablet didn't interfere with that, but was, was more of a tool for um, working with women. So um, this is um, the end of my presentation. And one of the things I would say in working in community-based practice and research, if you wanna go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Uh, thank you for listening. And um, if you um, want to contact me, um, I can be contacted through the John Hopkins University School of Nursing. Um, my email is psharps1 at jhu.edu.